Hi, how old are you? Oh, it's probably not very polite of me to ask such questions. Well, I'm 34, but some of the atoms I'm made of can be almost as old as the universe itself. Some are a bit younger, but still they are also billions of years old. And this is a piece of a meteorite. It formed in the early solar system while its parent body was undergoing differentiation process. Decay of radioactive elements warmed the asteroid or a protoplanet up. Heavier elements like iron and nickel sank deeper to the center and the body acquired a layered structure. Then probably a body was destroyed in a giant collision and its fragments were scattered across the solar system. And part of it eventually got to Earth. Its age is over 4 billion years, yet it's still a little bit younger than the solar system. But if my atoms are billions of years old, why am I not saying that I'm billions of years old? Well, sometimes it certainly feels like it. Or else why nobody says that this meteorite is older than the solar system? even if the material it's made of had formed before the sun. Let's say you paid the full price for the diamond ring, but received a ring with a piece of graphite instead. You probably wouldn't be happy with the excuse. It's carbon, atoms are the same, who cares? In short, even if individual atoms of this meteorite are older than what we would call its age, the matter has undergone substantial changes. But since the material melted in this fragment, it hasn't changed much. At least it hasn't been completely destroyed. Yes, it melted entering Earth's atmosphere. But in general, it's still the same fragment of a meteoroid that broke off of its parent body billions of years ago. But if we melted it, mixed it with something else, and then made, let's say, a Monopoly figurine, I don't think anyone would say that this is 4 billion years old. But what if in the solar system, or even on Earth, there is material older than the solar system itself? Material that survived formation of the Sun, planets and chaos of the early solar system and then got to Earth. It's there. Or else, what would this video be about? Let's talk about the oldest material on Earth. What it is, where it comes from, what it can tell us about, and also, how do we even know it's older than the Sun? My name is Andre, and this is Cosmos Elementary. This is a photograph of Orion Nebula, a part of a giant Orion molecular cloud complex. Its origin where new stars are formed. And this is a photo of a young star, and you can see a protoplanetary disk surrounding the star. Perhaps there are planets forming in that disk. It's made of gas and dust. Even though dust is only 1% of that disk, it still looks dark because of the dust. Here, resolution for that disk is not that great. But these images of protoplanetary disks made by ALMA Observatory are a lot more detailed. Studying these images, we learn a lot about how our own solar system formed about 4.6 billion years ago. In short, the formation went something like this. A fragment of a molecular cloud collapsed, with the help of the gravity, a protostar formed, which then became our Sun. Because of the conservation of angular momentum, the leftover material took a shape of a disk where planets formed. How do we know it happened 4.6 billion years ago? We know this from the dating of objects of the solar system. Meteorites, especially chondrites, play a very big role in this. Their age is determined to be 4.54 to 4.57 billion years. They are primitive, and we know this, for instance, from their composition, which, except for the lightest elements, like hydrogen and helium, is almost the same than that of the Sun, which formed millions of years before Earth and planets. Since then, the material those meteorites are made of has remained almost unchanged. But again, I'm talking about ages of the Sun and planets, even though the material itself they made from is much older. But the material has undergone changes, and the age of those objects is what matters now. But even on Earth, we find material that is older. And that's the stuff that survived from pre-solar times. You might have a couple of questions, though. Firstly, how do we even determine ages of any samples? And secondly, why do we think that those samples are pre-solar and not that the age of those samples mean that the solar system is older than we thought it was? There are various dating methods, and I'm going to mention today at least one more, but first let's talk about radiometric dating methods. So there are stable and unstable or radioactive isotopes. Isotopes are basically different variants of one chemical element. A typical example is dating using carbon isotopes. Almost all of the carbon on Earth is carbon-12. 
It's a stable isotope and its nucleus has 6 protons and 6 neutrons. The atomic number tells us the number of protons. All carbon isotopes have 6 protons, but the number of neutrons is different. Carbon-13 has 7 neutrons, carbon-14 8, and carbon-14 is an unstable or radioactive isotope. And it, as all of them do, decays. In that process, energy is produced and other isotopes and particles appear. Carbon-14, when it decays, forms nitrogen-14, which doesn't decay any further. An important thing here is that radioactive isotopes decay at predictable and known rate, and this rate is different for different isotopes. Scientists use here a concept of half-life. To put it simply, it's average time needed for half of isotopes to decay in a certain sample. And every isotope has a certain half-life. For some, it's really short, seconds or even fractions of seconds. For others, it's billions of years. For carbon-14, it's 5,730 years. Let's say we take a sample of carbon-14 and isolate it. In 5,730 years, only 50% of that carbon will remain, and the other half will turn into nitrogen-14. After another 5,730 years, there will be only half of the first half, or only 25% of the initial amount, then 12.5%, and so on and so forth. It's becoming a bit more clear how knowing half-life of a certain isotope, measuring the proportions of a parent isotope and decay products, it's possible to calculate the age of a sample. If we put a cube of pure carbon-14 in a time capsule, dug it somewhere and then later if somebody found it, just by measuring ratio of carbon-14 to nitrogen-14, they would be able to determine the age of the sample. So it's the basic idea, and that's not exactly how carbon dating specifically works. There, scientists compare the amount of carbon-14 and carbon-12. But carbon is not a good option for determining planetary ages. Its half-life is too short. A widely used method is uranium lead dating. It uses uranium-238, uranium-235, and also include thorium-232. Half-life of uranium-238 is about 4.5 billion years, which is in itself enough to determine, in several half-lives, ages of objects almost as old as the universe. For uranium-235, it's over 700 million years. Uranium-238 eventually decays into lead-206, which does not decay. Though it happens in many steps, there is a whole chain of decay, but most of half-lives of isotopes in between are quite short, just minutes or even seconds. This is roughly how it works. We take some Earth samples or a meteorite, measure proportions of uranium-238 to lead-206, and knowing half-lives, determine the age. Great! But perhaps you might have another couple of questions. How do we know that half-life of uranium-238 is 4.5 billion years? Sure, in the case of short-lived isotopes, we can just see, wait and count in a lab. But in the case of long-lived isotopes, we don't have to wait all the way through. We can take a pure sample of an isotope, observe it during some time, measure how much energy it produces during that period, and using proper equations calculate how much it would take for half of isotopes to decay. And then there is another question. Well, in my example with the time capsule, we could just write something like here is a sample of pure carbon-14. For some reason, we would want to mess with our descendants and not simply write the date. Our hypothetical descendants would know the initial amount of carbon, which would allow them to calculate the age. Unfortunately, there was no body to write anything like this for us. So, how do we even know the initial isotopic ratios? What if there already had been some lead-206 when the sample formed? Then our age estimates would be wrong. That's actually a problem, and there are different ways to solve it in various dating methods. In the case of actual carbon-14 dating, which is normally used to determine ages of fossils of some organisms, scientists use the fact that when an animal or a plant dies, there is no more new carbon-14 coming from the atmosphere or with the food. And the proportions of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in the atmosphere are known. When the uranium lead dating is used on Earth samples, scientists take into account zircon minerals which are known to contain almost no lead on their own. That means that all of the lead found in those minerals must come from the decay of uranium-238, and that's how we know the age. But even if we are not quite sure in the initial amount of a certain isotope, we can use multiple dating methods on a single sample. 
And if the results agree well, we can be pretty confident that our age estimates are correct to a certain extent. Unfortunately, in the case of our geologically active planet, a significant amount of material has undergone substantial changes. The age of the oldest known Earth samples is about 4.4 billion years. And studying meteorites this way, we have come to a number of 4.54, 4.57 billion years. So what's up with the pre-solar material? Where was the pre-solar material found? It probably won't be shocking to you if I say in meteorites. How do we know it's ancient? In geology, there is a law or a principle of inclusions. It's very simple. If we have some fragments, we cut it open and see some inclusions, they should probably be older than the rest of the fragment. So the pre-solar material is found in inclusions of meteorites. Obviously, this law is not enough to tell that this fragment is older than the solar system. Obviously, we need something more substantial. First hints that meteorites might contain pre-solar material appeared in the 60s of the last century. And first pre-solar grains of silicon carbide and diamond were found in 1987. Based on what I've been telling you up until this point, you might think that you can determine the pre-solar nature of those grains by measuring their age. True, but there is one more thing. Those fragments have anomalous isotopic composition. The first elements to appear in the earliest stages of the evolution of the universe were lightest elements – hydrogen, helium-4 and a couple more isotopes. The rest of the elements were formed later mostly in the processes involving stars – thermonuclear synthesis in the cores of stars, supernovae, neutron star collisions and so on. Our Sun is not the first generation star. Actually, first stars are yet to be definitively found. So for our Sun to appear and to be the way it is, as well as for our Earth and even for us, stars had to die. And the cloud our solar system formed from could contain the material from multiple stars. In the formation of the solar system the material mixed and changed and so solar system has distinct isotopic ratios. Obviously, let's say different planets have different chemical compositions. The rocky Earth is different from the gassy Jupiter. But on average, ratios of certain isotopes in the solar system is in the limited range. And now imagine, you find a sample with drastically different isotopic ratios. It has anomalous isotopic composition. First hints of presolar material came from anomalous isotopic signatures of noble gases like neon and xenon. Different stars may have unique isotopic ratios, as well as various processes can produce distinct isotopic proportions. For example, these graphs show isotopic ratios of oxygen. Everything that there is in the solar system is here in this little red square. And then you find something that has ratios, let's say, over here. This is a good indicator that the material is older than the solar system. Here is another graph with more isotopes. You can also see here supposed sources of material in certain types of meteorites. And now the most interesting thing. Here are images of pre-solar grains made with a scanning electron microscope. These grains are basically solidified fragments of other stars, stellar matter condensed at a certain time and place in a certain star. Actually, cosmic dust is a topic for a whole separate video, I may get back to it someday. Some of those grains could have come from the outer layers of red giants and stellar outflows, others from supernova explosions, and there can be other sources. So we're not talking about individual atoms that formed before the solar system. This is actually relatively large fragments that got to the pre-solar nebula, then survived throughout its history, got included into asteroids and eventually got to Earth. Small pieces of other stars here on Earth in the form of graphite, silicon carbide and diamonds. Not all meteorites contain presolar grains, those are actually pretty rare. Only about 5% of meteorites contain presolar material. The oldest known material found so far has been identified very recently. The study came out last year. But the meteorite itself had been found a long time ago. I'm talking about the Murchison meteorite. It fell in Australia in 1969. Initially, a fragment of that meteorite was ground up, the powder was dissolved in acid until only presolar grains remained. Scientists compare this process to burning down the haystack to find the needle. Grains in that meteorite are among the largest ever found – 2 to 30 microns or micrometers. This is a microscopic image of one such grain and it's about 8 micrometers in size, which is comparable with a red blood cell. Dating methods used for these grains is a little bit different from what I've already mentioned. 
Here, scientists use cosmic ray exposure dating methods. In short, the more time the material spends in space, the longer it's exposed to energetic particles called cosmic rays. It gets bombarded with those rays and they penetrate the material. There, they interact with the material and new elements are formed, and they accumulate with time. In this study, it's specifically helium-3 and neon-21. And it turned out that the age of some grains is about 5 billion years, while others are even older at 7 billion years. These silicon carbide fragments probably formed in outflows of dying stars. This is the oldest material known on Earth today. Findings like these are very important. These are very unique samples of long-dead stars we would never be able to get our hands on otherwise. Such grains allow us to learn more about stellar evolution, about the synthesis of new elements, about the formation of stardust, and also stellar formation rates. For instance, the data in the last study I mentioned points to the star formation burst in our galaxy that could have happened 7 billion years ago. Links to all of the sources are down below in the description, and if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Bye!